Welcome, Dr. Nick Gabler, to the Sony Podcast Show. Yeah, it, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. And I remember when we met, I think we were drinking some beer in a conference in Australia and had yep. some great conversations. And uh, yeah, so for those that don't know you, just share with us your background. Yeah, so thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm a professor in animal science at Iowa State University. Um, been in the US for probably over 16 years now. Uh, originally came across as a postdoc and started off in Indiana at Purdue University and did a fair bit of work with um, Joel Spencer, United Animal Health, on some omega-3 fatty acids, uh, especially DHA and EPA in swine nutrition at, back in the mid-2000s. Then moved across to Iowa State and then um, joined the faculty in 2008 and went through the whole promotion tenure process over the last 12 years and here we are. So, yeah, so originally, yeah, just grew up outside of Melbourne, Australia, um, was mentored by uh, Mark Joyce, Brendan Tatham and um, Professor Frank Dunshay, who's now at the, Univers or is at the University of Melbourne. They were probably my biggest uh, early career, at least undergraduate to graduate mentors. Um, yeah, so... And then kind of do a lot of nutrition, physiology research with pigs and also teach our undergrads um, growth and development at our junior level and advise students here in our program. I love it. And let's see here, Nick, where to start, right? You've done a lot of great work. I guess we can start with the, with the whole thing around disease and nutrition. For you, what were the biggest takeaway when you're doing that? that research and you probably still are doing some of that yeah uh, well the backstory of that whole research theme um, probably started with the national pork board or we probably late uh, probably 2010 ish where um, where there was a lot of interest in nutrition by health research and then um, everyone was debating what type of model to actually use. And so at the time, most of us in the academic environment, we all gravitated towards endotoxin or LPS inflammatory challenges. And then our stakeholders here in the Midwest said, look, we don't want to, we're not going to fund anything or touch any research that's really related to endotoxin or inflammatory challenges because it is not mimicking what we see every day in the field. We want to see, you know, we deal with viral and bacterial pathogens and a lot of the times the endotoxin um, work is a great model if you want to study the febrile response and acute inflammation. But it doesn't really represent what's going on because normally you've got a peak infection within, or at least a peak febrile response within probably two hours or so. And then unless you continually infuse it and increase it, there's tolerance. And then pretty much the pig has cleared it within 12 to 24 hours based off all the work that um, Illinois or Doug Wable, Illinois did back in 90, or, uh, 1997 now and um, and Seng, et cetera, did a lot of the early work with endotoxin. So it's great to model inflammation, but um, it wasn't really um, the producer's cup of tea to actually model disease by nutrition research per se. And so we um, explored different models and eventually um, we settled on using a, a PERS model to do a lot of our nutrition by disease research. And then we've moved that into other, um, other pathogens, some bacterial pathogens that include um, Lysonia and, and Brachyspire for, uh, for ileitis and swine dysentery respectively. And then there's always the E. coli and Salmonella side. But the other thing the producers said, they didn't really want Salmonella research at the time because there's already a lot of Salmonella going on. So they wanted something that's more or less from a growth finish standpoint has a bit more application and PERS was makes the most sense for us here in the, mid, in the Midwest. I love it. So what would be um, some, I, I like the word rule of thumb. So I guess what would be key takeaways? Hey, and I know it's going to vary by strain, but based on what you did, how much was that negative impact from disease and how much that affected uh, performance and or nutrient requirement and then we can jump in a little okay can, what can we do from a more practice standpoint yeah well i think the the biggest thing we've got to remember is what well, doesn't matter especially with pers and also this goes for um, pathogenic e coli or hemolytic e coli as well but pers isn't pers and then hemolytic e coli isn't always hemolytic e coli because right. 
it, at least on the E. coli side, it depends on what toxins toxins they have present within them. They can be non-toxigenic through the multiple toxin factors that are present within it. And the same goes for PERS. You've got different kind of, we'll say, isolates or open reading frame sequences. And then some can be um, very mild. Some can be highly pathogenic and have high mortality. And, and then it's just a matter of you've got everything in between. Um, and so I think the first thing is we can't always put those pathogens in always in the same basket because it really depends on what we're, which one we're actually utilizing or working with. Right. And the same goes for stuff in the field. Um, yeah, but uh, we, we use a PERS that um, isolate that came out of growth finished production. Um, it's, it was called, mainly it's a dirty isolate per se. It hasn't really been purified and cultured. Um, but then it, it's been consistent for us. We've reported um, multiple times to have anywhere from a 10 to 30% reduction in, uh, one of our isolates has a 10 to 30% reduction in growth rates and feed intake mm -hmm. uh, in pigs. Uh, another one can be 50, even 65%. Wow. Uh, but the other caveat is, is when we say how much does it impact, outside of the mortality question, how much does it impact performance? It also depends on what period you measure performance. Because yeah. if you measure performance up to just peak infection periods, which is like a lot of E. coli salmonella type work does, right. Right. then yeah, you get this big magnitude of difference at that peak, whether it's two days or one, one to two days, three days post challenge. Um, with, and then depending on the pathogen, like PERS will kind of initiate kind of a peak least performance impact within seven to 14 days. You're not going to see much. We don't see much really in the first three to four days post post inoculation. Brachyspira or swine dysentery, even Lasonia, um, they take about anywhere from seven to twenty-one days to actually manifest a kind of a clinical picture or even a subclinical picture with, with that can be detected with growth performance. And so, depending on which period, but really. We look at, um, typically we would look at a six, a minimum of a six week growth period, at least performance period from inoculation over a test, over the pathogen challenge. That's kind of our bread and butter, five, six weeks, because then that gives us an opportunity to see how the pig initially responds to the infection, how it happens during peak infection, and then also normally on the back end of clearing that particular pathogen, What's it, what's it do, how long does it take to clear it? And kind of that six week window is pretty good in control challenge study to kind of get those three segments assessed. And so over a five to six week segment, you could be anywhere from yeah, um, 10 to 30% reduction in growth rates with PERS is what we've typically reported. During peak, it can be 50 to 60, 70% reduction in performance. Okay, up to the peak you say. No, like you during that peak for remix period. Mm -hmm. It just depends on when you assess it. Right. And and it's impressive how much they recover after that, right? After the peak, I I guess, from that standpoint. And I would be interested, I don't know if you have any one of those studies that went all the way up to market. Yeah, um, well, one of our first studies we we did, um that um that's this was with um with Choice Genetics and the National Pork Board, and then the big kind of group of us, consortium of us. We actually, this was done in um, maternal line barrows. Okay. It's what we did this in. And we took them from, we did 114, roughly 114 day kind of challenge study. Okay. And we had pigs in, in, in a control barn and pigs in a, um, in a, okay, a challenge barn. So there was, there was a, we can't rule out a barn effect, but we did everything we could to, to uh -huh. account for those differences. Mm. Um, but really, we took them all the way out. We did not see the maternal line pigs compensate at all in the sense of growth post-challenge. They pretty much had a decrease in growth in the first couple, three weeks, and then they just went parallel with performance all the way through to market and took them an extra two or three weeks to get to market weight. Okay. So that was with maternal line genetics and barrows. We must, you know, we're going to grow a bit, bit different. Mm. But then right. we, we used some of the commercial terminal stuff we haven't done a true kind of um non-challenge versus challenge but just based off growth rates and kind of modeling projections um the modern day genetics will start responding about kind of six to eight weeks post challenge and there is some compensatory gain okay. that will catch up but the degree i think is dependent on the diet also dependent on the um 
severity of the challenge and also mm. the, the genetics of the pig. So there is some catch up growth at the back end, just how much actually is, um, is a kind of really unknown at this point. Mm. That makes total sense. It's super interesting. And I remember uh, when uh, Kyle Kobo was running a study at K-State in the, in, the, in the university there, a smaller study, it was a fiber withdrawal study, and the pigs had flu. And, and, and he was uh, weighing the pigs every five days because of that fiber withdrawal study in late finishing. And it was incredible to see in the case of flu, which is going to be different than PERS, yeah. right? But the compensatory growth in the next week was incredible. Incredible. Yeah. 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 Now, flu, they seem to respond pretty quick. We did, um, we collaborated on a study with flu, and they, yeah, feed intake dropped for that peak, like in the first couple of days during that peak kind of flu period um, in the infection study. But then on the back end, um, two or three weeks later, they were, their growth curves were just, you know, feed intake and growth rates were really good. And so there's actually, they seem to respond, rebound from that very fast. Right. On the flu side of things. Do you think, Nick, that, that sometimes we in our community, uh, we look too much at growth and uh, not enough at survival? And I, I think most people agree, oh, we need to look at mortality. But I guess the question is, instead of 80% growth and 20% mortality, should be 80% mortality and 20% growth, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's been some critiques of some of the work that we've done. Um, we just don't have the mortality associated with some of our pathogens. You know, challenge models um but in reality i i i think i divide it i think what we've seen so far our research what all, all the stuff we've tested with nutrition by disease we kind of falls into two camps there's a camp of ingredients or let's say management structures whatever you want to whatever you want to call it or products that we can improve survivability in other words we're not hurting we're not um in, we're preventing uh, we're improving survivability not hurting mortality but yet those products don't do anything to support the growth performance of, and feed intake, feed efficiency of the pig as they go through it. But yes, they can, they can keep the pigs alive. Right. Like uh, xylanase, maybe, right? Some, some yeah, well, xylanase, maybe. There's some electrolyte stuff out there and some other things. Yeah, it keeps the pig alive, but it's actually not doing anything to support growth. Right. Either before, during, or after that challenge. And so that's one that's one aspect. Then the other, then the other side of the coin is there's a lot there's a few a few very few um, say nutritional strategies out there that will support growth performance of the pigs, but it's not they don't really do anything. They're not moving the needle at all on mortality. And so there doesn't seem to be anything that's going to really do both at this point that I've seen. Interesting. And then the other thing is, is that um, with mortality, you really need to. We really need to do it in in commercial settings with commercial stocking densities and so and larger numbers to really. Right. Think, I mean, there's always been the argument: how do you pick up differences in mortality? Well, you just need large numbers. Yep. And you need to do it in under commercial stocking densities and conditions. And so we just, at university settings, we just don't necessarily have that capability. Yes. To really test mortality and survivability. Yep. No, absolutely. And and one thing that I've been trying to to punch that that uh, idea is e even though it's hard with smaller studies, I think we should report, right? Because then someone can run something later, right? I think yep. uh, something that I, we've we've missed. I think as a community, ah, it's hard to pick up, so I'm not going to even report. Well, just put yeah. the numbers, you know. Well, I think there's a lot of things out there, and I, I think it's one of the drawbacks or one of the biggest issues with our, with the scientific, like academic scientific community is that um, it's harder to publish data that's not necessarily significantly different or, or positive in a sense. And right. so we should be, I'd love to see more papers that are published in our, in our journals that we look up to or, you know, we put a lot of our work into that yep. support just, hey, there's no difference. We had mm -hmm. a great hypothesis. We tested it. We yep. did everything that was scientifically sound, and then yeah, we didn't see anything because that's that's so. Then we have to go redo a whole lot of studies, and you hear down the track, oh oh yeah, my mate down the road just did the same study two years ago. We saw the same thing. Well, if we knew about it, yeah, then we can get around that. So I think we need to publish more stuff that, and whether it's mortality or anything, that there may not be differences, but just put it out there. Yeah, that that's spot on. Absolutely. Um. 
All right. So disease by nutrition, very cool, very cool area. And then I guess that that's a link probably to the whole gut health and, and microbiome. I get, and I know you have some thoughts on gut health, but, but also microbiome before that. A few studies that I've seen that follow the pig through, throughout, after we stop the intervention, it seemed that the microbiome go back to, to normal, if you will. And again, we can argue what, what's good, what's bad, and I don't think I know, but- the, Well, what's normal? <laughs> yeah, what's normal, right? Yeah, what, well, normal is what you find there from, right? Just, just for observational, but what was interesting to me that after you interfere, people talk about, oh, it changed this, that, that, sure. But just like the growth and compensatory growth standpoint, the, the gut goes back, the, the, the microbiome goes back to, to, yeah. to whatever was before. So it, that's also interesting. And again, we, sometimes I think we just look at that window of time and forget about the rest, you know? Yeah, well, we forget about a lot of the, whether it's the luminal environment or even the intestinal epithelium, there's a lot of redundancies actually in that whole system. And so, yeah, something might change for good or bad, but then another, whether it's another bacterial population will come up and take over or you know, in cases you know, certain cell types within the epithelium will change and they all kind of work together to create or at least to maintain a homeostatic environment for the host right and so it's the same with bacteria i think um a lot of i think the most interesting area there's two i find there's two interesting areas with microbiome one area is what we need to do more research on is where is the actual what are the actual microbial populations producing in the sense of metabolites and how are they beneficial to the host we got to move away from i fed a pig x and y and then populations went you know this population went up this one went down and it makes no absolute biological sense at all because we took the whole host out of it and yeah. we're just focusing purely on the luminal environment at least the microbial populations we need to do a better job of actually stating what's going on with the pig itself as these changes are occurring. And 80% of the papers that are out there that showed microbial changes due to diet X, Y, or Z have ne- aren't reporting the actual pig, you know, pig phenotype. What's going on with feed intake? What's going on with growth rates? What's going on with health status? Mm-hmm. What's going on with all this stuff? There's, there's no difference. They, they just say, oh, there's no difference or they don't report it. And so we need to do a better job of actually putting the host response together with the microbial response to whatever intervention or whatever treatment was done. Yes. And then what are the metabolites that are being produced? And then how is the actual pig utilizing them? And where is it utilizing those particular microbial metabolites? And so that's one area that I think we need to do a better job at um, and to, see, to, to really see what's going on. And then the other area really of, uh, with, with, metagenomics and microbial kind of work is um is really what what microbial populations or species are are predisposing pigs to certain health disease types like is there something that makes a pig more susceptible to a lasonia or to a brachyspire or to any coal a hemolytic e. coli is there a certain population that's good or bad that's pre-challenge and yeah. so and then is there predisposing factors so we, we can feed a diet and then we can exacerbate one enteric pathogen over another. Well, how does that diet manipulate the population of bacteria? And then what's the predisposing factors? And then how can we kind of avoid that? And I think that's the other area that I think we need to spend more time on is the predisposing kind of factors that drive changes that then makes pigs more susceptible to pathogenic challenges. I love it. Yeah, make that makes so sense. Do you think? I mean, I think majority of the the studies are just observational, right? Do you think we're seeing increase on the on the randomized type of um, studies on microbiome? Um, what do you you mean more on the design side or just? Yeah, like a cause effect, you know, uh, a design study, so you can randomize and then now you know if it's the cause versus just an overall observational study that's just association, you know. Yeah, well, I think the biggest thing is that um, the studies aren't taking, aren't reporting, or aren't aren't taking into account the host is the host, the pig, the host should be the number one target, not mm. the microbiome that's within the host. And I think, and I think we need to flip our thinking around because we're we're being too focused on what the luminal microbial environment actually is. Well, 
does it really matter if there's a lot of redundancies there? It probably does matter to certain in certain contexts, but then the question should be, well, what's going on with the host and how's the host responding to these things is the way we should be looking at these questions. And I think we've just got lost in this for the last 10 years or so. We've been too busy trying to figure out the populations and, and some metagenomic changes, but not what does it mean for the host? So I think that's where we need to go with this type of work. Yes. Do you think uh, microbiome today, anything one can do right now in their diets or not quite there yet? Um, well, it's a loaded question because it depends <laughs> on what's the context you're trying to improve. No. Well, I guess my question is, are you aware of any microbiome research that we can actually use right now? I'm, I'm not aware. I'm yeah, not well, I mean, well, I think there's some, there's some direct fed microbials out there that are, that are showing to, I mean, uh, I haven't seen all the data, so I don't, I don't, I can't say how the validity of, of the results, but uh, improving um, feed intake or the improving um, survivability of yeah. pigs and so forth. Well, that's kind of the anecdotal, I wouldn't say claim, but kind of the underlying premise for what they're doing. Yes. And then also, okay. yeah. um, and so I think that there is some stuff out there that, that is beneficial. Mm -hmm. I think the micro, the list, the microbiome work may have a, um, a list of products out there would probably have a better role to play within um, ABFs kind of flows or systems mm -hmm. where there's, where there's no, where there's no antibiotics ever. Yeah. I think with in, in conventional systems where there's still therapeutic use of antibiotics to, for the treatment and prevention of disease, I, I think there's less chance for the microbiome kind of to really step up and kind of take a leading role within manipulating whatever pig physiology we're after. So I think there's a few studies out there, but just or a few places out there, but it depends on what we're trying to manipulate, what we're trying to improve. Yeah. Like um, if we try and improve, um, say, growth rate. So one of my pet peeves with the industry is that the industry has been going around and say, oh, well, we've got product X, which is a, it's an alternative to antibiotics. Well, we've got to be very careful here. What's the context? What are we trying to replace? Mm -hmm. And so, and you've seen a lot of this as well, but um, if the, really the context is, is that we were trying to replace sub-therapeutic antibiotics use for growth promotion is where this whole uh, antibiotic alternative stuff drove from with the BFD coming in and, in the late, um, what, in 2017, when it kicked in, is to get rid of sub-therapeutic use for growth promotion. So if you're coming up with an alternative to antibiotics, the context needs to be, is it actually supporting growth? Because that's what we use sub-therapeutics for, was to drive growth or maybe feed conversion a little bit. So if your product isn't driving growth or feed conversion, then you can't really say it's an alternative to antibiotics. Because if it is, then the only other option is you're saying it's a drug claim where it's having a therapeutic effect and then we're not allowed to, you can't do that. Oh, really? And so I think if we're trying to find alternatives to sub-therapeutic sub antibiotics, then we need to make sure that there's going to be a growth or a feed efficiency benefit because that's the technology we're trying to replace. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very good, Nick. I never thought about that that way. Let me ask you about... I know we moved away a little bit from the nutrition by disease conversation, but on that, I have another question on that topic still, which is on the implementation, right? What folks can do today on the overall nutrition? Would you change? I mean, people always ask, right? Should I change my lysing requirement or whatever else? What's your thoughts there? Okay, so again, it comes down to context of what pathogen or what disease state we're trying to manipulate. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've been trying to develop data sets for the industry to, say, to either say, okay, well, it's horses for courses. If we've got this type of enteric problem, this is a strategy that we've, we see that works or doesn't work. If we've got a respiratory or a systemic kind of pathogen challenge, well, hey, this seems to work or some hybrid of, of it. And so I think we need to, first of all, get to the context of what we're trying to manipulate. And also it could be horses for courses. In other words, you've got you got sprinters, you got distance or stayers. So we've got to figure out, okay, well, what are we trying to achieve here? So there's been a little bit of work that shows um, there with this um, hemolytic E. coli that soluble fiber or fermentable fiber can be beneficial 
in helping those pigs kind of decrease shedding and potentially improve growth performance. Uh, I think there needs to be more longitudinal studies to really see what the impact is over that, over the whole um, growth period in the nursery. Um, there's other studies that have um, state that there's methionine or threonine can be beneficial. So a single amino acid is beneficial to certain health challenges or kind of challenge states. We haven't really picked on one amino acid in our work. We're being, we're, the biggest thing that we've seen that works in a PERS challenge situation or a PERS with, with some strep sewer secondary, and even with some PCV2 secondary in there, we've seen that increasing the lysine to energy ratios of the diet by about 120 to 130% works to improve growth rates in, in, and feed intake growth performance of the pig during a PERS challenge. That is the only thing that we've really tested to date mm -hmm. that has moved the needle significantly enough to show there's a growth benefit during a PERS challenge if performance was our outcome. Right. Now, we've tried some other stuff with some water deliveries and some gruel type feeding. That's good for survivability, but it didn't move the needle with regard to growth rates in the pig. So, so to answer your question, the only thing that we see that's kind of can be implemented right now that seems to be beneficial and being consistent in a PERS challenge model with secondaries is increasing the kind of amino acid to energy density of the diet seems okay. to help. That is interesting because I was under the impression, I mean, go back, I think uh, mid-90s with Dr. No Williams' work on PERS, I think in his work, if you recall, uh, you can help me there, but it's um, he didn't see a change in that requirement, right? But then the question that was, the, that was in the requirement, not necessarily in the growth aspect. So, so okay, if you, we're talking about amino lysine requirement during the health challenge, what we're seeing right now is that at least with purses our model and goes for some of the other models is that the lysine requirement still stands around that 10 grams per day or 10 grams per um, pound. It, per pound. But yeah, per pound or per kilogram of gain, whatever it is, and that seems to be pretty consistent. Yeah, and there that and it's feed intake that's really the driving factor in amino right. acid uptake. And right. so, if feed intake drops, the lysine requirement does not change due to a boost in the per state of the pig from what we can see. We're not increasing the lysine need for the pig growth rates and lean tissue accretion. We've actually measured lean tissue accretion is the same rate relative to how much lysine and essential amino acids they're taking in. So it doesn't seem to change the requirement of what that pig needs. It's just the requirement of what the pig eating seems to be different or describing their growth lean accretion rates. And so, so a lot of Noel's uh, work, I mean, we it's pretty much our data sets agree with some okay. of the stuff there. The other thing is that, yeah, as, as I said, it seems to be feed intake Draw, explains a lot of the growth performance um, phenotype Reduction. reductions in, um, in a, most disease states that we see. We don't see an increase in endogenous losses of amino acids with regard to PERS challenges and so forth. Um, where Schweer did that work, um, it's been reported. Um, we, we, we don't really see any major change of, of what amino acid amino acid requirements is really a feed intake driven response and so as as feed intake drops growth rate drops if we can get feed intake up the pig will grow better that's what we seem to be seeing interesting so when you said that the what do you say 110 uh, or 20 to 30 percent increase in the lysine right you mentioned on that that study yep. that helped so just to make, make sure I, I get the numbers right. So you, you mentioned 130, but it's 130 of the actual number. So it's a 20 to 30% increase, right? Oh, yeah. So when we're talking about 120, 130%, we're talking about increasing the lysine to energy ratio that much. So we, we've worked with the, with, um, with the mash offs and the, and the National Pork Board. We've shown that if we can keep, if we keep lysine, and most of the essential amino acids to lysine, that ratio is kept the same. Mm -hmm. But then, but then if we cre increase that lysine to energy ratio up, mm -hmm. then we seem to be able to support better growth 
and feed efficiency in those pigs as they grow through a PERS challenge. That's what, we're, that's what our data would suggest. And we can achieve, that. we showed that two different ways. One, we just increased using synthetics and also soybean meal, we increased the amino acid content relative to energy. So mm -hmm. that's one way we did it. And we want to see, okay, was it a energy issue or was it an amino acid issue? So then we diluted in it, kept amino acids constant, and then we diluted energy in the diet. And this is the sand diet that, that people have heard me talk about. We, we fed about 14, 16, 18% sand in the diet to dilute mm -hmm. energy by about 20%. In this, just to show it was a proof of concept. I wouldn't recommend it for the <laughs> pit because of because of pit issues, but really that. And then those pigs actually ate to their energy needs, and their performance was as, their growth performance was the same as the 120 percent. So how we achieved that ratio didn't really matter. Whether it was increasing amino acids or decreasing energy, the ratio seemed to be important. There. Now, the practical aspect is, is that when we did that work, when Jessica Jasper did that work, um, we repeated it with, instead of using sand, can we use some sort of an, uh, another inert type product, like a fiber product? So put soy holes in. Mm -hmm. If we put soy holes in, we screw up feed intake and therefore the pigs didn't eat to their energy needs because they couldn't get enough feed intake in to get the same response. And therefore, we, wouldn't, we couldn't replicate the same response with soy holes. So because of the bulking aspect. So appetite was critical in actually driving that ratio to get the same response when we dilute energy. Interesting. That makes sense. Yes. Does the, let's see, does the numbers, so the controls, when you increase that lies into calorie ratio as well, did they respond or they didn't respond at all? Uh, what you're referring to is the controls because everything was PERS challenge. So uh, everything was everything. We don't have okay. You, we oh, we don't have a true like a true negative control on those diets. Ah, okay. See, I'll be be interested to see because I mean, you can probably argue well were they slightly deficient in lysine? I mean, borderline five percent below requirement. And that's why they responded, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. We can't rule that out. We I mean, we just can't rule that out. But based off. Um, yeah, we just went off internal production kind of requirements, the curves that were done internally with um, with our collaborators, with Mashoffs, and they've told us that that's where they were comfortable with what they're feeding. Mm -hmm. And so that's, yeah, that's what we saw. Interesting. But yeah. the big, getting back to one of your other questions with that is that you asked me about implementation. So one of the critiques or criticisms that we've had is that, well, we don't know when pigs are going to actually break with, PERS, and so you, we always implement our diets at the point of inoculation. And so that's really not a practical aspect to do. So we're doing some follow-up research um, now, we'll start in the next couple of weeks, where we'll probably come in about four weeks post inoculation. Mm, so once we're past that seroconversion kind of kind of peak and they're on the back end of that challenge, mm -hmm. then we'll implement some diet strategies at that point, which then we'll see how they go all the way through to market from there so so that would be a bit more practical so if you know you've got a barn that's um that's um got a at least a purse challenge or some sort of disease challenge once the bins run out when you have to switch phases well then you're an opportunity to come back in and actually switch the bins switch the feed out then and then maybe go back a phase or two because all right. we're doing is really just increasing the, the amino acid density of the diet and that seems to be beneficial right okay and if you think when you, I know you diluted the diet when on the energy side. Did you also did the opposite, meaning adding some fat and see if that helped? No, we didn't. Okay. Because we, um, we 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 we've seen more success with regard to the protein amino acid aspect rather than the energy aspect with PERS. Okay. Cool. So we cool. haven't done anything on the on the fat side. Cool. And then the other question is just on the. Uh, uh, they respond to lysine, but then we don't know much on the late finish. Like if you follow them through all the way to late finishing, do that follow the what you previously mentioned overall? Like you mentioned that they come down and and go parallel, but now that you manipulated them through amino acid a little bit, I I, I would be curious to know like you know what I mean? Like in late finishing, does that really has still an influence or not? Because we do know that you can be a slightly deficient early finishing. Yeah, then they'll catch up and then there's no right. difference. 
right yeah away. well that that's why we're doing this other study we're going to follow them all the way through because we ended it six weeks post challenge in these growth finish bigs so we never we didn't really get all the way through nice perfect awesome nick um let's see if we go into gut health uh we talked about microbiome and now uh, just gut health overall i know you have some interesting ideas um you know the definition and, and also some of the maybe the flaws right on the on that are you setting me up here <laughs> <laughs> um yeah well, I, i think gut health i think it's one of those kind of ubiquitous terms that i think we just need to clearly define what we're talking about and so um And I think that's one of the um, one of the issues I think with the word gut health. Well, what is what does it mean? It means something different to for me than probably for you or someone else. So the first thing with gut health is actually probably just defining what it actually what you're actually referring to. Um, you know, what's the context of gut health here? And so really, in my my definition would be um, gut health is where we're, where the pig can optimally support digestion secretion excretion also optimally support kind of immune or host defense in other words barrier function integrity um and then and then um and also kind of be able to modulate uh luminal pathogens etc and be able to keep them out and so i think it got health is, and it could be any degree of those uh, those things is really what we could classify as gut health and so and then i think we we think of it too simple it's mm -hmm. too simply you know just because we're changing villi and crypt measurements i would argue that does not necessarily uh, mean you're doing anything to gut health it depends on the context just because we're measuring some biomarkers in blood we had this conversation before doesn't mean those biomarkers are even associated with gut health and so we've got to be careful of how we interpret it but it also comes down to what's the context of gut health we're referring to right no i love it what would be a best way to set up that experiment in order to figure out maybe if this biomarker x is important if you want to set up an experiment if we pick gut health let's talk about leaky gut I mean, that's, the, that's another buzzword that's in the industry. Well, first of all, leaky gut, what's normal? Um, we don't really know what normal, normal mm -hmm. with regard to leakiness actually is. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be extremely careful when we're talking about leaky gut because are we talking about paracellular leakiness? In other words, translocation through the tight junction, like the, por the porosity of the gut and to, to allow bacteria and other kind of molecules kind of leak in. Or we're talking about kind of transcellular like, um, translocation of stuff because a lot of pathogens actually don't necessarily come through the tight junctions or in between epithelial cells. They hijack machinery that's already there that are on, like whether it's on the M cells or on the pterocytes. If you're talking about some of the, you know, rotavirus, you're talking about um, Lusonia, you're talking about PED, they actually come through the cell and into the enterocytes or into the colocytes. They don't actually necessarily go through in between the cells mm -hmm. and so a lot of times we refer to leaky gut as pericellular transport like in between the cells rather than through and so we've got to be able to kind of match both i mean we've got to be careful of how we're going to talk about leakiness mm -hmm. and what is leaky and then so how to how to design a study or how to look at that i think the biggest flaws that we have there's a lot of biomarkers out there with regard to intestinal health whether it's some of the lactates or you're talking about intestinal fatty acid binding protein, talking about um, endotoxin, LPS, um, LPS binding protein, et cetera. Some of these markers, they haven't been validated necessarily in the peak to say, well, if we see an increase or decrease in feces and blood and urine of these, has there been actually any damage done to the intestinal epithelium? So in other words, is intestinal integrity or leakiness alt even altered in the intestines to say that these markers have changed because a lot of these markers could be changed just from post-absorptive clearance because they're all there they're not just not there even the control pigs have them so a lot of it could be or well, the liver is just clearing at a different rate so therefore it could be a, a post-absorptive clearance and so if we're going to look at these biomarkers i think we also need to take a step back and make sure we validate there's actually been damage done to the intestine with regard to leakiness at the same time 
And then once that's been shown and kind of validated, then you can probably, under the same context, you can show that leakiness is, um, is occurring and this based off a biomarker. Interesting. Yeah, it's beyond my expertise, but I love that. Yeah. I mean, the same thing goes. I mean, there's a lot. We talk about redundancy, and we see we've seen this. Where um, I think we just got a paper out in one of the Frontier journals, where we looked at um, swine dysentery or, or brachiospire challenge with um, Dr. Burrow at the vet school. Emma Helm, one of my PhD students, published a paper that really shows under swine dysentery you have a a um, hyper secretion of mucus in the colon. That's just part of the disease pathology or the, the pathology that goes on but then we don't see any changes with regard to permeability of macromolecules or if we look at translo- um, uh, look at electrophysiology measurements of intestinal permeability we don't see a lot of a lot of major changes occurring in the hind gut because there's redundancy there once we've lost that structural barrier the pig will secrete more mucus to actually increase that secretory anchored mucin barrier so mucus thickness increases and then that prevents a lot of stuff from translocating. So we can't just say a disease state is causing increased leakiness or leaky gut because I think it depends on the disease and depends on the, on the pathogen and, and what biology is working on. Mm-hmm. So we've just got to be careful. I think the biggest thing is context. We're just going to provide context for how we look at everything. Yeah. And we can't, we can't just paint everything in the same brush. I love it. Yes. Wow, Nick. Um, let me ask you about just um, critical thinking in general, right? Um, I think you are a very good thinker, and uh, I wish you know we all had a little more of that. So, what um, anything that you do or the way you go through things uh, could be on the literature, but could be just in in, in general too. Uh, any way we can improve our critical thinking? Yeah, um, well, I'm the first to admit I'm not a, a, an, an, uh, I haven't necessarily had a training as an applied nutritionist. Mm-hmm. So, that's, so when I look at nutrition, at, um, the way I look at nutrition, I look at it through the physio- through an eyes of the pig's physiology. What are we trying to manipulate or what are we trying to change? And so, and so that's one way that, you can think a bit differently. Okay, well, what are we trying to achieve here if we change the diet from X to Y? Or we want to use this product. What's this product going to do to the host? How are we going to manipulate whether it's a reproduction outcome, whether it's lean tissue accretion, whether it's disease susceptibility or whatever? And so look at it from the lens of the host or of the of the pig, in other words. What's the pig's physiology telling us? And, and then what are we trying to manipulate? And does it make biological sense by adding X, does it actually, is it had any chance to change Y? It could be cause or effect, but then, so you start thinking that way. Um, so I challenge my students to think that way. I mean, we do feed formulation, but we don't do a lot of it. We do, we do a fair bit of it, but not, not as much as other groups. Because mm-hmm. we're trying to manipulate the pig's physiology. We're, at the end of the day, we're in the lean tissue game. If, for pig production, we're trying to create pork. That's lean tissue. So whatever we think about, we've got at the end of the day, we've got to make sure meat quality and, or pork quality and lean tissue is actually at the forefront of what we're trying to do. And, and that includes on the reproduction side because numbers born alive, et cetera, that's absolutely critical. Uh, the other thing that I encourage my students to do is um, I expect them to be at the barn to do a lot of the work on their projects because if they see an anomaly in their data sets, in other words, pigs go off feed or something happens because power, we've had power outages, we've had storms, derecho storms this year and so forth. Mm-hmm. Well, they, can, they know that the problem that their data set is, is that because we had some influenza come through or these pigs came in under this health status and they just were very slow to get started or they got chilled. And so I think having eyes on the barn, on the research, and actually seeing, looking at what the pig tells us, mm-hmm. um, especially for my students, so they can see that is, is absolutely critical for them to help interpret their data. And so hands-on, I mean, it's, it's like we can easily manage everything from a desk, but if you actually have spend a bit of time at the slat level, you get right. a better understanding for what's going on. So I try and get my students instilled in, okay, well, make sure you know what's going on at the farm and also 
make sure you know what's going on at the lab, but also at the same time. And so finding that happy medium um, also helps them interpret their data. Because a lot of times you, they might say, oh, well, this happened. Well, why did it happen? Oh, I don't know. Well, if you're actually more involved with your project, then you probably would know what, what caused that or at least have a better idea. Um, the other thing is I, I think it's important for students and even for us um, as nutritionists and production type people is to understand a little bit more on biochemistry and also on physiology. So, so how does it make sense for these two things? And even immunology, if we're doing more disease work, does it make sense for these things to come together? And does that pathway even make sense? And so that helps us kind of weed through what would be snake oil versus, yeah, this is log logical. So having that understanding, yeah, I think it is also important. Right. No, I like that a lot. I mean, something that I've been, I thought a lot over the years was uh, when you start thinking about that, 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 you know, listen to the pig, like you said, you know, one example for me is classic is late gestation that we think you read the book it says well uh, protein requirement goes up well yes but it, it's it doesn't mean that's gonna go to the to the baby pig because she prioritized herself well yep. the, she prioritized the pig so that means she's already giving everything to the pig you give more it's not gonna change the pig so it's super something that looks obvious doesn't we, we when you look across the literature it seems like the sow in this example is giving you the answer, but if you just look at the book sometimes, it's, it, yeah. it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, this, this goes for the PhD students. I tell my PhD students all the time, you're getting a doctorate of philosophy, so you should be able to think through something. And there's no reason why you can't go to cancer. If you've got the basic tools, you, can't, you can go to cancer research, you can go to corn science or whatever you like, because you've got the mindset that's being trained and distilled in, in, in your thinking. And so it's just a matter of trying to develop that. And so they should be able to read something in the biomedical field and say, right, does it have an application to pig production? And then, then the next thing is, as they're, as they're going through their training, is give them the confidence and also the opportunity, if they want to, to go test that. And I think that's what we need to do more of, is say, right, well, read this, and then do you think, as new sets of eyes, do you think that has application to what we're doing in production? And then also, I think there's nothing wrong with trying to um, challenge the old, um, whether it's dogma or old wives' tales of what we think, like you just alluded to, what's, what's, we think we know something and then we just accept it because it's what we've always done. And so we, we had that kind of earlier this year with the whole slow growth stuff. Uh, uh, we, I proposed feeding 97% corn to pigs back in March before the whole COVID stuff. And then people were laughing at me saying, Really? Well, That's. Well, they say, well, well, we can't feed corn. They're going to, you know, they're going to have social vices. You're going to cause, um, there's going to be a, um, you're going to get too fat and so forth. Well, well, let's try it then. Let's just see if that's. That's actually a, a opportunity to actually just try something that's very practical at the time. It's not mm -hmm. ideal because the whole idea, if we're trying to create a lysine, or so if we're trying to create an essential amino acid deficiency in the pig, the easiest and most practical way to do it is just pull out any synthetics, synthetic amino acids or, or bean meal. And then you just run it for straight corn. So that's why we ended up with the 97% corn diet. And then we did not over, over the period of time that we did it. And granted it was only for, um, we did about anywhere from two to six weeks we did a four-week study we did some with two weeks with um, new fashion um, some with two four and six weeks as well in late finishing we did not really see a huge bump in in adiposity or back fat in the pig now it was going in the right direction it was getting a little bit more but it wasn't kind of beyond a point where it's um where it's actually going to be meaningful to anyone if the goal was just to keep the pigs alive so we can slaughter them rather than having to, having to get rid of them another way, um, it worked. It was very cheap and very easy to do. And so I think challenging those, and that's why why um, the Iowa Pork Industry, Industry Center here at Iowa State, we were so fast to try to get data out back in March, April, May, before this all started, is let's try some of these things that we think might work, but then give the industry the opportunity to then kind of try it themselves and say, hey, we saw this in small numbers, now go try it. 
and so give them the confidence. And the same thing with students, give them the confidence to try something and then if it doesn't work, they learn from the mistakes. In our case, if it didn't work, we were gonna put it out there so everyone could see. Yeah, feeding that much corn is no good. Or feeding X, Y, and Z with, with calcium chloride or, or neutral detergent fiber was gonna be no good. Then we'll put it out there because it saves people making the same mistakes. So I think we've got to create room for our students as well as the industry. We've got to make mistakes, but we learn more from our mistakes. I love it. Yeah, the whole slow growth. What what is the as we get close to, to the wrap up here, Nick, uh, I know you're busy there. What uh, was the biggest take home for you? Um, I think the biggest take home is that if there's a problem and I think in the industry needs information, then I think a lot of our land grant universities can come or at least can come together or independently, depending on, on what it is, we can get the data out there to help the industry in, in real time. So that was, that was one of the things. And even the industry comes together and just helping each other out and say, right, we don't know this, but we had companies, we had the universities, we had allied industry all coming together and say, hey, here's the information that we're doing. Let's just share it. And then, and then just let's all try things. So I think coming together as industry, when, when we're at the point of a crisis or in the midst of a crisis was actually very encouraging. Mm. The speed of which data was getting put out there um, is, a, is a kind of a testament to the students and, and the farm staff that helped generate all that. That was, that was something very encouraging. And then uh, I, think the, I think the biggest thing is, is that um, we were able to help the industry and shows the importance of at least in academic institutions can actually we are, we are we do play a role within our production system, and I think that really highlighted the importance of what we we can all do together because we all help each other out. We all got common interests. Yes, yeah, so, no, that, that went very fast, went very well done. Um, so here's the three questions, Nick, that that I ask every guest. The first one is, what's your favorite uh, book when it comes to pig pig production, nutrition, or whatever else? Uh, one of my favorite books, I like the book that um, uh, John Patience, and I can't remember who the other editor was, on the, the feed efficiency book. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's just, a, it's a really good read at all different levels. Um, it's feed efficiency of the pig, I think it was, at of the Bargainhagen mm-hmm. Press. I, as a general kind of book to talk about, a bit on genetics, a bit on um, winged pig, a bit on sow, and a bit on um, like energy lysine kind of stuff. I think that's a, just a good read introductory type book and also a little bit of really good information just for students just to get into and read. Um, mm-hmm. It's also good, I'll, um, I like students to read also the NRC and figure out what's good and bad within it. Just kind of the, like the early chapters on, on that. Um, I think they're, they're good books just for kind of some foundation to build on. Yeah. What would be your preferred book when, uh, when it, I guess adding one more question here, but your book when it comes to bay, uh, physiology or those things? Uh, physiology, um, to be honest with you, I don't think that I don't, I don't know of many good pig related physiology books that are out there. Um, I think a lot of the physiology stuff, I think we're better off going to review papers. Mm-hmm. that are in journals and actually that are very targeted to whatever physiology in question and use them as a starting point um, because normally they're a little bit more up to date with some of the modern kind of techniques and thinking right but however with review papers it's also important you got to go back and trace all the um trace all the papers back to make sure that the um the, the review that's citing the papers is actually citing that them that reference in the right context because a lot mm. of times they'll pick out something but then the whole context was left out and it may not necessarily be the right reference for for that so mm-hmm. i think from a physiology standpoint even from an immunology standpoint i think going to review papers is is probably a really good start for for anyone to go to very nice how about a book in general outside of agriculture that you've read over could be a book or resource over the years that that really changed the, the way you think um i think uh some good a good resource was i've only read parts of it i haven't read all of it just on management and efficiency was the was it the toyota way okay yeah um, it just talks about how they 
became so efficient back in the 70s and 80s and some of their stuff. I've, I've only read parts of it. I haven't read all of it. Um, that seems to be a good management book. I'm not big into the, a lot of the self, self-help self type stuff. Self-help, yeah. It doesn't have to be self-help. could be yeah. anything. could be novel, you know. And, yeah, but, but I think some of the management stuff and then um, I think interacting with people, I think that type of stuff being pretty good. But I think from a, purely just from a management structure and just efficiency of how to set up organizations and so forth, that the Toyota way was a, had some really good things in it. Nice. I think is that like lean manufacturing, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Very cool. And then finally, what do you think sets apart uh, successful swine professionals from those that are not? Well, first of all, I think there's a place for everyone within our industry. doesn't matter what, um, what gender, race, et cetera, or, or even um, say um, intellectual capability or capacity yep. you want to yep. be at, there's a place for everyone. Um, and so could we have a lot of advisees that aren't going to go to vet school? I mean, just to be honest, the, the GPAs aren't going to be high enough to, to get in. Mm-hmm. And then they are some of the best animal caretakers and best kind of farm, at least the managers, the farm managers, because they've got a passion for the animal and yet they haven't got a PhD or a DVM. So I think there's definitely a place, a place for them. Yeah. A place for everyone. Um, what sets apart really um, someone would be, I think you got to have the, the passion, the drive, uh, that you gotta be willing to speak up, make mistakes. And then I've always learned more from my mistakes than, than, um, than from stuff that worked. Mm-hmm. And so I think learning, be, be learning how to cope with, with, with rejection, mistakes, etc. I think, yeah, I think a person has that is willing to make those mistakes. Well, they don't make the same ones all the time, yeah. uh, but they're willing to try something new and just think outside the box yeah. and then give it a shot, uh, I think is, um, is one of those attributes. And just, yeah, try something different or new. Just because we always do it, ask why we do it that way. Yeah. And then if you're not happy with the answer, then do a little side project study. You can just be very small and then, then just show your management that, hey, maybe we could try it this way. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's better. So just try something new. I I give all my graduate students if they have a good idea and they want to try something, as long as it's within reason from a financial standpoint, I'll let them try it because I think that really encourages them to think and then also to hopefully it works or or ask a question, challenge it, and then they can learn from that. So that's been very, I think, giving them the opportunity to do that. So don't be afraid to do that. So from a manager standpoint. Give the people, give your people working underneath you or reporting to you, I should say, give them the opportunity within reason to come to you and say, hey, let's try something different and then listen to them, I think is a, is a key thing. And then, um, and then also as a manager, uh, I always get in there and help bleed my pigs, necropsy pigs, whey pigs and so forth. So I think uh, there's times where it's good to lead from the front and there's also times where we have to step back. but be willing to go do some of the kind of the grunt work yeah. and have respect at all, le- all levels of, of the organization hierarchy, I think is also important. Yes. No, I, yeah. Like challenging the status quo. I, I love that, that you mentioned. And, and, um, and also it's interesting because I always ask this question and I never gave any context, but, but success is a very, uh, personal right so success for one person is different from the other you know so so that makes total sense so yeah i mean yeah i think for me being in academia i think success is one of my biggest kind of um ways i look at success is the in probably another five ten years is what is all my students that i've directly mentored whether it's advisees undergrads through to graduate students where they have they achieved their goals in life what they wanted to do Right. And did did we have an impact on them to help them get there? Yeah. Or even ones that um even ones that I don't directly you know directly mentor, but still bump into the hallway or at a meeting or or in the mm-hmm. field, mm-hmm. just one or two conversations, and then off you. I mean, you you hopefully done something to help them. And uh, I think, and if you know, in ten twenty years time, I can look back when I'm older, and then say, yeah. right, these people are, have have 
achieved what they wanted to do in their careers and their life, then and we've had an impact on that, then that's um that's very that's success for me. Yeah. Doesn't matter how many papers I publish or what gets cited or anything like that. Um, it's those, that personal development, seeing students go from coming in naive, not knowing anything about what career they wanted to do, to see them go off over the vet school into into production agriculture, into research, into graduate programs, and then see them grow and then and then show them all the possibilities what our great field has. Right. I mean, that's um, very fulfilling. Yes. Creating an impact, right? Yeah. Just, I love that. And that's all at different levels. Because you can impact anyone. You can impact someone for two minutes or three minutes. Right. But you can a conversation with a, with a, a North American professor for literally 45 minutes to an hour. And then I ended up spending the, uh, I've spent the last 16 years wow. in the U S just from that one interaction. So wow. what interesting, what, what was unique about that? That one. Well, I just was talking about what I wanted to do in my research and mm. what I was interested in, interested in doing pig nutrition stuff. And then, um, and then that, that interaction, they opened up an opportunity for a postdoc. Then that led onto something else or something else. And so, uh, it's just, taking the chance on a career or just meeting, talking to someone about what you want to do. So just having a little, and that person had a big impact on where I'm at today. Right. Yeah. The, the butterfly effect, right? Yep. Exactly. Awesome. Nick, it's been a joy. Uh, really appreciate our time and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com. Yeah.